So let's go into the history of the Bitcoin. Okay, Bitcoin first, all right. Satoshi, who is this legendary man? Three, two, one, and we're live. So have we actually landed on the moon, yes or no? Yes. No, bullshit. Really? Really? I call bullshit on that one. Oh, okay, let's hear it. No, well, you see, if you slow down the footage, right? Yeah. From the guy that's like bouncing up and down. Okay, okay. Armstrong, Sir Armstrong, right? Yeah, yeah. And if you slow down, he just looks like he's taking a, a walk. Okay, but I'm not going to argue about any of the footage. No. I'm just going to say that we've actually gotten some samples back from there. I've shot a laser off the moon, seen it reflect off the mirror. Excuse seen me? Seen evidence of that. You've shot a laser off the moon? Not me personally. My university has. I was just looking at that. Wow. But it's just, they left a mirror up there. You can check the time between the two points to make sure the laser covered that distance, exactly <laughs> where the moon should be. And that's one of the easy ways to check that we've been up there. Whether the videos, I don't get into that kind of speculation. As in people have been up there or just robots? This is what I can't speak to that. I believe people have been up there, but I'm not an expert on that topic. So interesting. I like to keep my foot out of those ones. Interesting. Anyway, Tomo Nazis, welcome <laughs> Nolan on the show today. We're going to talk about some cool things. And actually today on the show, we're going to learn how to make millions of dollars on crypto crypto money. Now, now, uh, now. I mean, amateur. Lie down before you hurt yourself. Crypto coins? Crypto co Bitcoins. Bitcoins. There you go. And crypto value. Cryptocurrency. Yeah. Currency. There, there you go. go. <laughs> yeah. So I'm absolutely uh, zero knowledge in this whatsoever. Okay. Um, but before we uh, go to the bit, 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 bit crypto, whatever they're called, those things that you can buy that fly around in the internet and mm -hmm. multiply themselves yeah, apparently. Yeah. Uh, before we get to them, tell us about what it is you actually do for a job. So for a job, I work currently as a plasma engineer in the semiconductor industry. Mm. I work with designing a plasma for a particular process to make computer chips. And I've been doing that for about nine years now. Nice. You lost me at plasma. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's start with plasma then. Yeah, Sound exactly. Good? Okay. What so is plasma? There's, you know, the states of matter, liquid, solid, gas, right? Yeah. There's a fourth state, mm. plasma. Is that like the ectoplasma from Ghostbusters? A little different. Oh. Could be, though, if you put it in the right thing. So plasma is a state where you take a gas yeah. and you super excite it. Super excited? Super excited. Okay. <laughs> it starts moving around so fast, so yeah. hot, that electrons start flying off. Huh. And you have an ionized gas then. Okay. So typically, we'd see it in like a closed environment if we're going to do it ourselves. Yeah. But technically, lightning, the sun, um, an incredibly hot fire, they're all forms of plasma because the things in there are moving so fast that the electrons start jumping off and it becomes super reactive. Interesting. What does that do? So we can use it in different ways. You can use a plasma that's contained in a small source mm -hmm. to try to either clean out something, react with something, even like say a gold coating or platinum coating something like jewelry or something for scientific nature, you know? Mm -hmm. We can also use it to cut things. So you ever seen those videos where someone takes like what looks like a purple torch almost and mm. cuts a car in half? Uh, Fun videos. Uh, yeah, I that's haven't a, that's actually a seen cutter. that. But, uh, that's a plasma cutter. Oh, so, so it's kind of like cutter. a real, real it, life lightsaber. It's a real thing. It's a that's yeah. a lightsaber. Yeah, but it's about like that much of a tip. Uh -huh. Or you make it longer, but yeah, it's pretty much a real life lightsaber. Like or a lightsaber that, should be plasma. Is that contain? What is that? It contain the length of the of the cutter? It's just tough because you need to keep the gas within a certain range. Otherwise, right. you're not using the right materials. Damn. So like lightsabers are a real thing. Yeah, they could be. It'd huh. be plasma. You could make like a legitimate lightsaber. It just would be incredibly unwieldy and right. unreliable. <laughs> is it purple only or could you change uh, the, no, color you change the color depending on what gas you use? So the wow. gas is all of different colors and you can mix them to make different colors. Cool. Because they're just colliding, releasing photons. It give off a nice little glow. Mm -hmm. The only thing is you couldn't bounce back lasers. Laser would just go straight through it. You can't stop light that way. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. What's yeah. the difference between a laser and a, and a plasma? A laser is just light. It's super excited light that's going at a very fast speed and very focused. Yeah. Well, no, sorry, not fast speed. All light goes the same speed, but it's just a very focused beam of light. Mm. Whereas plasma is a different state of matter. Okay. So lightsabers is actually a real thing. They could be. <laughs> I don't think anyone's... Well, one guy on YouTube made one for fun, but... Yeah? Yeah. Well, I'm going to go check that video out later. Fun one. <laughs> Absolutely nuts. Anyway, so what do you use the plasma for? So personally for me, I work in the semiconductor industry making computer chips. Right. So we're using it to cut into materials mm. because to make a computer chip, you need to cut small lines and different materials. Mm. And a laser can only cut through certain things. So I'll make a laser shape on top and a certain coating where we can do that. Then use plasma to pass that shape down onto the next layer or to cut sideways or anything. It's just for cutting through dielectric materials, metals. Wait, computer chips are about that small. 
when you make them, they're about the size of a pizza. It's like a whole disc you make it on, and then you cut it into small pieces later. Really? Yeah, it's 300 millimeters typically nowadays. They're working on 450, but most of it's done at 300, some at 200. What's inside a computer chip? A lot of layers, <laughs> a lot of <laughs> connections. I only work on like one out of a few thousand steps, so I only know my small section. Wow, what is your step doing that connects something to something? I, I cut. I you make, just cut? I make holes and remove things. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Tell me more about this plasma. How does it work? So, have you ever seen like a, no, um, I mean, like a fluorescent lamp or science something? Science for like dummies yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, plasma, the, the, the reason it can cut through things and do that so efficiently is because you have these super excited particles. Mm. So, they're very reactive and there's a shield of electrons around the outside. But because they're ionized, they're very reactive to either electricity or pressure or temperature change, something like that. Mm. But we use electricity to do it. So, you have all these things that are very reactive that want to lose their charge. Oh, okay. And become neutral. Ah. So if you got an electrical charge that's the opposite to them, they'll go flying towards that. Okay. So you can make them go very fast, very quickly, and then bombard with things. Don't understand how you can control it in such a micro environment. That's why you build giant tools for it. <laughs> yeah. Giant tools. Yeah. I'd like to go on a tour one day, find out what these plasma, how they really work. It'd be cool to watch it, right? There's some good ones over in Belgium or in America. There's some good places you can look at that. Yeah. Go yeah. and see it. Cool. All right. So with science, tell me what it's what it does for me. I mean, in my life, I don't use science for anything, but what is it? Well, how is it implemented in, in our daily lives, for example? This microphone, the computer over there, it's all based on the technology I'm working on, semi wise and trying to build that trying to create a better life for everyone more ease i guess like mm. over every generation our lives have gotten easier right yeah i mean just look at the last 20 years since the internet exactly. started you can find Nuts. any piece of information you want in, a, in the fingerprint right yeah so let's go back to the moon again well no <laughs> seriously because they didn't they never landed there i don't believe it i just don't really? understand this yeah okay like we have more you know like techno technology in yeah. our telephones than they had back in those days yeah so how, how is that even possible? So tell me about the moon stuff. Yeah. Well, look at during World War II, they were launching rockets at England. From where? From Germany. From French French German border area. Yeah, but that's not so far. Yeah, it's not that far, but like, <laughs> you got to think about the leap you make from there from 20 years of the internet, right? True. So rocket technology can get pretty far. Yeah, but we're still talking the 60s, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, the 60s. <laughs> one uh, small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I think that was very yeah. traumatic. I thought it was it so was... propaganda. <laughs> I'll be honest. I'm hey, from Denmark. Hey, it could be propaganda. If it is, it's good propaganda. Yeah, it really but. was cool, right? So what about, what's his name? He made a song about it. If Which you one? believe they put a man on the moon. I don't know that song. I think it's R.E.M. Oh. I'm pretty sure it is, yeah. Anyway, good stuff though. But so you've done what from the moon? You've shot lasers on the Not moon? Not me personally. No. But I've seen the data from people that I have been went to university with. I've seen some of the findings that you can measure the time it takes for the laser to go from Earth to the moon, bounce off that laser and come back to the receiver that we have on Earth. Mm. And the amount of time that passes between those two events of you shooting it off and receiving the signal back. Right. And it's exactly the distance it should be. So the amount of time, so it cal so with time, you know, like with the velocity you're calculating the amount of distance you cover over time. Mm -hmm. So we're able to calculate that time that it takes to figure out the distance because we know how fast light goes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so next question. Why is that important? Because that proves we've been there. Oh. there's We had to put the mirror up there in the first place, right? Right. Well, somehow. Somehow, some way. There's a mirror up there. Mm, true. Someone put it there. Unless there's something on the other side of the moon that we can't see. <laughs> the dark side that doesn't rotate towards us? Uh, yeah. One, yeah. Do you believe they're aliens? Um, I believe they're definitely aliens. I don't think they're on the moon. <laughs> I think there's definitely aliens out there without a question. <laughs> Interesting. That's funny. Hmm. Science. What is the first thing one should learn in science? Like, what's the first thing you learned that you first remember? First thing I learned in science? How to start a fire? Uh, is that science? Technically, you're doing experiments, seeing what burns, what doesn't burn. You're doing the process of elimination to try and figure out how best to run a fire better. Mm. It's a scientific process. Right. Every kid starts doing that when they're young, right? Interesting. Well... <laughs> I used to like, you know, you get those little like glasses and you like start trying to burn ants and stuff like that. Yeah, I didn't really burn bad. ants. I started leaves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, my best buddy and I back when we were kids used to try and start fires in his driveway with the magnifying glass. Yeah. We start with the leaves. We figured out what would burn best. Oh yeah. And we kept doing that until we set his fire on driveway so bad that we melted the driveway. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Someone got, must have gotten a hiding <laughs> for that. <laughs> 
I have done many things with uh, the the melting glass or whatever you call it. Yeah, because my brother oh, the magnifying the glass. The magnifying glass. Yeah, yeah. No, like, we'd get like b boards, right? Uh -huh. and just like you know, burn like names and oh, they do like, the, like almost like laser like. etching, but instead with like a magnifying glass, yeah. pretty much. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool actually. I That's really awesome. enjoyed that. Fuck, I haven't thought about that in ages. Yeah, that was crazy. That's science for you, man. Yeah, well, so and I guess <laughs> I do use science. And when hmm. you were, when you were fighting, that's science. How to generate the most amount of power possible from your body? How to get more torque out of your leg kicks? Well, maybe I don't That's look at physics. it as science, but it, it, you don't think about it as being science, but your brain's still doing it, right? Like technically, it's happening on a subconscious level that your brain is calculating. Okay, how far away is that? How quickly can I cover that distance? Mm. And it's not science in the sense you're writing it down to calculate it, but mm. your brain is still figuring it out, right? Like there's those classic videos of Cristiano Ronaldo. They'll kick the ball, shut out the lights, and he knows exactly where it's going to land. Yeah, that's He's crazy. calculating physics in his head to do yeah, that. That's crazy. You were doing the same thing. Yeah. Predicting where a punch was coming from, how quickly it could get to you. Right. That's true. That's true. I just, you know, thought it was lots and lots of practicing. <laughs> <laughs> and then you figure out the science from that. Yeah. You that's true. To write down, if you had someone write down on paper for ages how yeah. to figure out how long that takes, kick's going to take to get to you, it won't help them. No. Actually, <laughs> it's true because you know what I did when I, when I was doing martial arts? I never liked to read about it. Hmm. It didn't make sense to me to read about, uh, like, you know, to have all these books about karate or, or yeah. whatever it is. I just never wanted to read about it. It's like, this doesn't make sense to me. Just let me go and practice for myself. How so? I'll because it's it more removed or? Well, I was a bit of a, uh, a snob. I see. Uh, in my training. Uh, I, it's the only way to really say it. I was very snobbish <laughs> about what I do. You gotta be. And so I would practice a lot and I would like come up with new ways and get really inventive. And I thought I'd come up with all these training methods all by myself uh, hmm. when someone has already written about it in a book somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so you reinvent the book every time. Well, I, yeah, I kind of feel like because I look at it as an art form, yeah. I needed to like express myself and learn to go through that way. Gotcha. Uh, and so I just, I practiced a lot, like a lot. Uh, so much that I ended up with two fake hips. <laughs> <laughs> That's science for you too, right? It's science, yeah. <laughs> Actually, talk about that because I was I was looking at it the other day, going, you know what? If you're gonna if you're gonna write the perfect training plan down yeah. for someone, right? Um, I could do that better today than I could back in the day. Yeah, because I, I would know exactly what to do, where, exactly, and how much to do of it, and mm -hmm. then just like believe in the process of it, and, and then you know stick where with yours that. kind of went and how you could kind of more make that more streamlined, more simple for someone else. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm actually in the process of coaching a, a current K1 champion right now, so I'm awesome. looking at what I'm going to work with him because I only have him once a week. Um, because that's all the time I want to dedicate to it, uh, delegate to it. <laughs> but the once a week, it's like, it has to be specific things that we're working on. Yeah. Because I can't just jam everything in there. Exactly. It's got to be a skill day. It's got to mm -hmm. be a specific day of working on skills and, and like getting his skill level up yeah. higher so that he can become a better fighter, basically. And knowing how much time it's going to take to cover those kinds of skills. Yeah. Yeah, getting it out to a science. Hmm, interesting. I should write this down, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> But I'll definitely go over this uh, later on on, the, on, a, on another uh, fight talks at one point where how would be the, the perfect programming yeah. for someone at a specific level. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, from because the, yeah, the baseline, right? Yeah, and now that we're talking about martial arts, we might as well just dive into it. Go for it. Um, but so it's, I feel like for martial arts, it's, yeah. it's, um, um, you have to have the basics down properly. Once you've got a certain level of skill, why would you go back and do those same techniques over and over and over and over again? Mm-hmm. Because when I went to Holland, they trained for 40 minutes maximum, and they just sparred. Really? Put on all the gear straight into sparring, and it's wow. just like, it's twice a week, and it's like, they're done. So in huh. Japan, it would be like, okay, we're warming up for, you know, 20 minutes. We're doing three rounds of shadow boxing, three rounds of, of you know, jump rope. Then there's Dang. like a, a bit of kicking on the bag, and, and then, you know, you get, you, you've been working out for an hour until mm -hmm. you get to the sparring. And by that time, you're already too tired you're to spar properly. So you can't use your full technique. You're much more exactly lazy and making mistakes. Well, it's just becomes the sparring becomes sloppier. In yeah, my opinion, yeah, that's what I meant by yeah. Yeah, but yeah. so if you if you go for it, right in the yeah. ring and just like put on your, your your gear and just like spar for half an hour. Yeah, then you're doing about ten rounds. It takes what forty minutes exactly. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. One minute break. Makes sense. Three minutes on. Yeah, it takes forty minutes. And it's just full full force sparring for them, or they sparred hard, but they also yeah. geared up a lot. Okay. All right. So yeah, I was training with Arnest Hoos back in those days, and then I went back to Japan. I was like, mm -hmm. "Why am I doing these two hours, three hour sessions when yeah. all they do is like take it down to the bare minimum? If it's a sport you're playing. Why don't you play that sport? Streamline it, avoid injury, try and exactly. Yeah. They wore shoes when they were sparring, for example. Whoa. Yeah, I thought it was it was hilarious. Like actually. wrestling style shoes or 
Uh, either indoor soccer shoes or wrestling style shoes. Huh. Yeah. So tell me about your martial arts journey. So mine's much shorter than yours. Yeah. <laughs> I've been doing uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for three years, did Judo for a few years as a kid. Mm. Started that way. And for me, it's been the most helpful psychological thing I've ever done. Really? Yeah. Why is that? You know, the it sounds cliche, but you know the idea of flow state, right? Uh -huh. Where you enter something and nothing else in the world matters and you're totally focused on your task. The zone? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So when someone's trying to choke me out, break my leg, tear up my ACL, nothing else in the world matters. I was focused <laughs> on that one task at the time. So true. And also, like, they've shown some weird science as well for jujitsu. The fact that, like, you get the same hormonal release as you from cuddling, which is, makes no sense. But it makes you the happiest person in the world after you're done sparring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cuddling, I guarantee you, you cannot cuddle it with its kickboxing. No. <laughs> well, the ref will break it up at least, right? <laughs> yeah. Wow, interesting. That's hilarious, actually. Yeah. But, I mean, so some guys are completely turned off by it, like rolling around with another guy on the floor. Yeah. But, I mean, I think that's just completely ridiculous to say. <sighs> yeah, and also, I grew up doing high school wrestling as well, too, a little bit. That was far worse for that. Yeah. At least jiu-jitsu, you can get more space management. It's a bit more of a relaxed pace. Yeah. With wrestling, it's much more intense and someone... Mm, that's like Roman Greco, Roman yeah, Greco Roman style, Greco style wrestling. Oh. Yeah, would you say that helped you in your jiu jitsu? Or it oh, 100%. You? Oh, yeah, it's, it's essential, I think, because it gets you that mindset of not to quit, beats that into your head, and also takedowns are essential because mm. the fight won't just start on the ground, you got to get there first, right? Yeah, American wrestling is, is quite fascinating, actually. There's a lot of uh, you see it in the movies and stuff, you know, yeah, like, I mean, you guys <laughs> get right into it, right? Yeah, <laughs> we don't have wrestling in Denmark, it's only like a minute 30, so like you got no time to go. Oh, for it. Yeah. really? I didn't know that, yeah, yeah. Uh, so in karate, we do two minutes, yeah, in the first, uh, the first two, what do you call levels of a tournament, yeah, yeah, and then from the best 32 up, it's three minutes, got it. Uh, if you if you get a like a hikiwake, it's, it's like a draw, then yeah, you, yeah. you get another two minutes. So it okay. the, the longest fight you could get potentially in, in my style, Kyokushin Karate, was three minutes, two minutes, two minutes, and then it's, it goes to boards. <laughs> yeah, how many boards? So you get four techniques to break boards with, right? Wow. So you're with your knuckles. Is it about style or the amount? Your elbow, your hand chop, and then foot. No, it's not style. It's okay. uh, four. Yeah, so you get, you get to pick how many boards you yeah. want to try for. And then uh, if you fail, you go down to two boards, and then you can anyone can break two boards. Okay. So I was really good at, at, at board breaking, actually. <laughs> I, no, I was really good at it. Like, well, um, like what was your record then? Uh, a total, I forget, but it was something crazy. It was six boards on the knuckle. With a punch this way. Wow. And I think it was nine with the elbow and also nine with the hand. And then it's 11 with my foot. <laughs> That's like those numbers, if you put them all together, would probably be a world record. I was like really good at it. <laughs> That's amazing, man. But I also had a trick because we were the ones that were like drying the boards that were yeah, used yeah. in the tournament. So we used to like practice on those boards. So you knew exactly what they'd be yeah. like. One time I was practicing and a senpai came in and that's another story, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> it's about your journey. <laughs> Fair enough, but yeah. For me, like, I, I find that really interesting, the fact that the way they did that. But the other one we have for jujitsu as well is we yeah. have tournaments where there's no time limit. Oh, Complete opposite. Really? Until, some, someone, until somebody submits. It keeps going. That's cool. Isn't yeah. It? I mean, that, that sounds like it's cool. Yeah, submission only. It's, it's great. It's uh -huh. just, it's sometimes like you'll have a 30-minute fight and you'll want to die afterwards and they have another <laughs> fight like in about five minutes. Right. <laughs> Oh, but that kind of evens out the the, the playing field, right? Yeah, yeah, because it, it, it ends up point because it comes down to points a lot of the time in jujitsu in normal tournaments like mm. Naga style rules or IBJJF, and the points are very much wrestling based. Mm. So you get points from the same kinds of things you would from wrestling. So the wrestler will typically have the advantage in a points fight, Interesting. but submission wise, not necessarily. But if you submit someone, then it's a game it's over. over. Yeah, no matter right? what, that's yeah. always game over. Yeah, but if the other person can just hold on long enough. So a minute and a half only. So what? what well, about that the was UFC at least when rules, I was right? growing up. I don't no. know. I might have. I might have never made it to the higher levels. But right. UFC is five minutes. Right. Five. Yeah. Three. Three. Three rounds of five minutes. Yeah. Right? That's because you're mixing it up. It's slower. Wrestling is just such a high pace. Yeah. It's funny um, because you're obviously you must you follow the UFC. Oh, very much so. Yeah. So I don't. Okay. Yeah. So I used to like doing martial arts. Yeah. I, I used to like doing it. I didn't like to like watch it. I see. Okay. So I haven't really been uh, on the scene for a long time. I'm like watching and following the f big fights or anything. So I don't know okay. anything about it, to be honest. Did it not entertain you or was it more like it was too close to home or affected you? It's like me not playing uh, fighting video games, for example. Yeah. It's like fighting, 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 fighting. Like, like ah, when I'm out of the gym, I just want to be out of the gym. Yeah. For yeah. me, that's my escape. So that's, I think, where the difference comes from. That right. was actually your job. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to go watch something too much on science when I get home or like on plasma physics if I'm spending my free time doing that. Exactly, right? Yeah. So it's supposed to be a hobby, right? You're exactly. supposed to enjoy it. 
takes the fun out of it, right? Yeah. So what's the worst thing that happened to you in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? I've gotten a lot of um, turf toe going on. I've got my left toe just always gets struck up with that one. A lot of pinched nerves in the neck and back and mm. those kinds of problems, but never any torn ligaments yet or anything like that. So I'm happy with that. What do you think that comes down to? Luck. Really? <laughs> Tapping early in some ways during practice, not during uh, competitions. Like that's the one thing a lot of people get pride taps where they won't tap to something because they want to hold on as long as possible to prove they can. That's Did, where injuries come from. But. Didn't the, the the Gracies like come up with that concept? It's like we don't tap. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> it's it depends. Yeah, I, I believe in tap early if you're getting older and you don't want to get injured. But oh yeah, absolutely. But in tournament, that's a different style. Like that's you you want to win there. But in practice, test it. Know who you're dealing with. Mm. If it's a new guy, just tap early. So you know. But if it's like a black belt, you feel much safer. You know. Yeah. You know they're not. Gonna, they know what they're doing. You know. The most dangerous thing is a white belt that doesn't know what they're Look, doing. In karate, there's always yeah. Well, that's dangerous thing is always white belts. It's yeah, because like, they they have no control. No matter what, they don't understand what they're going through. Yeah, and it's like the worst ever. It's like I've had the most injuries sparring with white belts than I have had with like sparring with black belts. Same here, especially when they wrestle too as well, and they know a little mm. bit what they're doing and just have power, and nothing else. <laughs> But there must be those assholes in there that just go for the locks and try to pop the elbows or pop the knees or something yeah. like that. Yeah, I've luckily worked in good gyms where they typically keep those guys out. Hmm. I remember this one guy. Uh, I think his name was Aoki. Oh yeah, yeah. That guy. Yeah. yeah have the stories I've heard of that guy. Just like he would like like hurt people. Yeah, yeah. Like on purpose. Exactly. For, like, and he'd more like it. Addictive. Yeah. It's just weird. I think that's the guy I was thinking of. But yeah. There's yeah. also, oh, I can't remember his name. There's one guy who's been kicked out of multiple MMA organizations from like holding on to submissions past when the referee tries to break it up hmm. and try to crank it that last a little bit more. Why? No, it's just weird. And apparently he's like the nicest guy outside the ring, but just during hmm. the fight, not so much. So I have one of my coaches that works with me, right? He also does, uh, there are two, three of them that do martial arts. It's kind of funny. We all end up in, in, in CrossFit, but. Yeah. <laughs> came there from the same <laughs> Yeah, we came from the same background. <laughs> but anyway, so he's. He got kicked out of one gym. I'm well, not kicked out. He was got refused membership at one gym. He uh -huh. said, "No, you can't work out here. It's not. You're not good for the environment or something." I, I see. Don't really know the reason why. Uh, and then he went to this other gym, and in the other gym, the guy, the owner of that gym, is like famous for doing heel locks. Oh, heel hooks? Not hooks, but locks. Like he will like anything. He he will somehow get yeah. to your heel at one yeah. point, and if he gets to your heel, you're done. Uh, right? This yeah. is the kind of D, like a heel uh, expert, yeah. right? Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, my coach, he comes back and says, yeah, you know, I just popped the guy's heel. And I was like, what's wrong with you? He's like, yeah, that guy's really teaching me some good stuff. I was like, dude, you need help. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff I want to learn. <laughs> it's like, you need help. <clears throat> yeah, anyway, I'm, I was, I'm a little bit parched, you know. Yeah. I thought I was, um, was going to bring you something. Okay. Um, so let's have a look at what I brought you. All right. Just for you coming on the show today. Thank you very much. I thought much. maybe a, a, a whiskey. Wow. Could be uh, yeah. interesting. I'm very much a whiskey guy, actually. You are? Yeah, but only recently, actually. Oh. So for me, I was introduced to whiskey in college, as mm. most people were. Jim Beam, some lower end stuff, you know, some yeah. of the stuff I can never rem rem yeah, remember the name of it. Yeah. But like two, three years ago, my best buddy here in Sendai, well. American dude from the South, started introducing me to bourbon and mm -hmm. some high end bourbon and really fell in love with it. And then living in Sendai, there's a lot of good stuff to make here. Wow. Okay. Well, do you want to open it up? More? That's beautiful, man. Let's go for it. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> My mistake. <laughs> Glenn Moran, it's really nice stuff, man. Thank you. Yeah. Gorgeous. Let's go for it. Yeah, I think we should, right? <laughs> I mean, it's okay to have a drink on the show. A few moments later. So let's pour some, man. Yeah, let's do it. Go for it. I actually have never tried the Glenn Moray, but it's I've a tried... B side. Space side. Space Space side. How do you say that? Space side. All right. Yeah, Space side. So this should be a nice, sweet one. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Man. Mm. That's very nice. Really sweet. Mm. Classic space side. Oh, yeah. That like comes right down your throat and then just goes. Oh, you got the nice little hug around your chest right there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Warm you perfect, up. Perfect. 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 Anyway, let's go back to talking about whiskey before we drink too much. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> as I was saying, like my buddy introduced me to it. And now I've started to get more into some more things outside American whiskey. Yep. I'm still new to Scotch whiskey, actually, mm -hmm. which is typically the reverse of most people. But yeah, at least. For me, I've found the variety you can get from Scotch whiskey really interesting because yeah. you can get so much different flavor out of it. And most of it's still affordable. It's a little expensive, but it's mm. not like you're talking wine prices where you want to get into that kind so of stuff. So why is it more expensive? That's a really good point. Why are certain things more expensive? Yeah, why Why are whiskeys? Like, I've seen bottles of whiskey, like a Blue yeah. Label, for example. That's almost $200. Yeah, so that's where it comes down to economics. It's supply mm. and demand. And also, so the two factors in supply are how much can does a store have to sell you 
Mm. And how long does it take to make it? How hard is it to make? Yeah. So the longer you have to age it, that's going to make it more expensive because you're sitting on this product for longer without selling it. Right. If you can make something the same day and sell it, you can sell it cheap. Most of them are 12 year old. Exactly. 12 or older. You have some 40 year old ones out there, some 60s. Wow. Yeah. So those ones take so long to age. You have to make sure they stay in those perfect conditions. If you have a mixer on it too as well, that's supposed to do a perfect job of blending the flavors together. Yeah. Then you also have to pay for that and that makes it more expensive. Then the other factor is if it's popular. If it's popular and they weren't expecting it to be, they've had to plan this 12 years at least ahead of time, right? Yeah, that's so true. So if it all of a sudden becomes popular and they didn't make enough of it, the price is going through the roof. Wow. Because there isn't any left. Yeah, that's true. And then if there's too much of it, you can sell it cheaper. I mean, it kind of makes sense, right? Exactly. It's, it's, how can you know? Yeah. I, I remember um, the Glenn Livid. Oh, okay, yeah, that's the twelve-year-old Glenn Livid. That yeah. was my first time to do a uh, to try a single malt. Nice. And so uh, when it first came to Japan, and now we're talking like twenty years ago at least, uh -huh. maybe more. Um, I bought a bottle for like a thousand three hundred yen. Yeah. And now it's like more than double the price. For the same that's bottle. Crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for me, that's one big thing for me because bourbon's had that wor worse than anything right now. I wish I had invested. <laughs> <laughs> I saw something on that. Where, like if you invested in whiskey rather than like the stock market, how much more success it could have had if you nailed it, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Buy just a whole barrel and put it in your backyard. Right. I mean, you never know. I mean, exactly. it's just crazy. <laughs> how does one actually make whiskey? What's like, what's the difference between like, like Scotch whiskey, for example, and it's an American like the um, bourbons? So the main difference for, to be bourbon has to be made in America, to be Scotch has to be made in Scotland. Obviously. <laughs> so yeah, those are the two first ones. <laughs> okay, <laughs> no, we're, it's all fun, but yeah, no, it's whiskey it's, for dummies. Here. Yeah, <laughs> but no, the other main difference is, is like what you put into it. Yeah. So with scotch, you have like the single malts or the blends and those ideas, and it's what you put into it. You're putting barley, or in some cases in Isla, you're stopping the barley from aging by smoking it huh. with peat, which gives it that smoky flavor, and then using the barley afterwards. So what you're doing is you're distilling alcohol where you put this in, you melt it down or you burn it up with water, you distill the alcohol out of it. Mm. And the different stilling methods also add flavor. So use a pot still in Ireland. I forgot the name of the kind of still you use in Ireland, in Scotland. And those can give it some flavor as well too. Yeah. And it's all about the environment these plants are grown in. But for America, you have a whole different game because 50% of it to be bourbon has to be corn. Okay. I didn't even know that. Which makes it way sweeter. Yeah, it's like, yeah. It's like just think of country. Like, what is the, the one that like Jack 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 Daniels right now, right? Well, that's actually not bourbon. It's not oh, it's Tennessee it whiskey. Oh, here we go. It could be called bourbon. No, yeah. they don't want it to be called bourbon. Oh, they're Jack Daniels. <laughs> it's Tennessee whiskey. <laughs> oh, okay, Tennessee whiskey. <laughs> but technically, it's it's but it's put super through the sweet. charcoal filter, which yeah. also adds more sweetness to it. Like, as well, I can't too. drink much of that without just like like. Sorry, it, yeah. it doesn't sit very. I'm well personally not a me. fan of it either. For me, it's too sweet as well. That's my main complaint. No, but it's like they use. I think it's sugar maple huh. for the charcoal, which adds more sweetness when they um, strain it to try and make it cleaner. Interesting, and that's what stops from technically being bourbon, but still able to be bourbon. Mm. It's made in America. It's aged over two years. It's done all the other because the bourbon is a legal definition by the U.S. government. Okay, so it has to meet all these different requirements to be called that. I can't remember them all off the top of my head. I just remember two years, made in America, over fifty percent corn. Mm. What's the other fifty percent? Um, you can make it out of wheat. You can make it out of rye. You can make it out of barley, and then the mix is how you get a lot of different flavors. And you all can right. do a hundred percent corn too. That would still be whiskey. But it's all the different flavor combinations that make the different. Do you know what? A, have. Do you know what aquavit is? Aquavit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's Danish. I've never like, drank it, but I've heard of it. <laughs> Danish schnapps, they call it. In yeah, yeah. And so you, I sit down and you, you shoot it in shots, right? It's not like something you mix and drink you, with something. You, you don't slowly sip you don't it and enjoy it. No, no one slowly <laughs> enjoys aquavit. It's like small, and they got the tall glasses, right? Like a little bit taller ones, long ones, and then yeah, you yeah. Put one in there, you just shoot it like that. Still, even like yeah. out of like a flute kind of glass, like the champagne mm. style. Yeah, yeah, like a tiny little mini mini champagne glass. <laughs> So my grandfather used to have two shots for lunch every day. Without fail, medicinal then at that point, right? No, just for, just, <laughs> well, he says it makes him, you know, <laughs> stronger. Looking at the dance, you know, I can't argue with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just have very fond memories of him drinking this for lunch, and he's like, yeah. I'm just going to have two shots. And I was like, oh, fantastic. It was really cool. My granddad, I used to really love him. You know, we'll yeah. go on tours, and then, like, how do you say, for walks, and you know, walk, I don't know, he'd hold my hand and stuff. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I got very fond memories of him. And I grow up, uh, I come to Japan when yeah. I was 18, and then I went back there, like, you know, when, whenever, I was 20-something, 20, 20 right? I remember for the first mm -hmm. time. And... uh 
I was like, yeah, I want to try that aqua eat now. <laughs> All right, ready to try this stuff, right? <laughs> so we get a bottle, we freeze it down, and then we, me and my friends, all my friends, we open it up and show it because no one really drinks it in Denmark. It's okay. Like, I don't know who drinks it, to be honest, huh. but it's always been there and always, yeah. everyone knows it, right? Yeah, yeah. And then so we take a shot and I was like, whoa, <laughs> what is this stuff? <laughs> anyway, it's made of potatoes, right? So in America, okay. this is what I wanted to talk about, though. Yeah. So it's our potato thing, right? Yeah. In America, you have, you know, massive farms doing corn and stuff like that. Yeah. So the alcohol makes from corn corn and then barley yeah, and stuff exactly. i find that fascinating though yeah it's what you have it's mm. what you work with you know what i did i actually brought another bottle <laughs> <laughs> getting exciting here no because you know what i thought i thought it would be interesting to like talk about flavors yeah and like try okay. and taste a couple of different ones so i'm awesome. just gonna open this guy up take a look at this one make sure i understand what's in this one first <laughs> okay yeah so i think we should go back and retest yeah. What the first one tasted like again. We have the sure. other set of glasses oh, yeah, over there. Yeah. We're ready cool, to go. Cool. So again, this is also another whiskey that I have never had before. Neither have I. So but these are research, new to me. Yeah. In research for the Tokyo Talks, right? Uh-huh. I consulted with Dumbfounded Media ah. on where to go and um, <laughs> and get some good whiskeys. And yeah, then yeah. He told me there's a shop uh, which has lots of variety. And I went yeah. in there and it was like, Like that kind of, holy crap. Yeah, I didn't move around, take it all in. And you know, they go, they go from like, there's like one, two, three, yeah, four. Yeah, like, yeah. And the shells go all the way up there. Unbelievable. So many different ones out there. Yeah. Ooh, those are some monstrous pores. <laughs> ah. So this is a Nomad Outland yeah. whiskey. Not quite sure what it is. It's finished huh. in Terry Casks. In Sherry. Sherry. Sherry Casks in Jerez. All right. Do you know where that is? Hey, do you know where that is exactly? Could be here in Scotland somewhere. Yeah. All right. Makes sense. Right, well, right around the border. Here you are, Nolan. Cheers. Don't be shy. Much. I'm going to taste this one again one more time. Right. First Start one. with that one. Okay, so this one smells good compared to the other one here. This one also smells good. They all smell the whiskey. <laughs> I just won the first one. The Glenmore actually comes out. With a really like, oh, it's got a really big punch. Yeah. How does the Nomad? The Nomad is nice. That that it's a much more. Uh, I don't know how to describe it. I'm not good at my flavors, but it's much more uh, deep. It's that sherry flavor. Like you have the sherry aftertaste, that oh. very sweet kind of wine aftertaste. Yeah. So whiskey, um, neat on the rocks, crushed ice. However you water, like it. Like what? What's the crushed deal? Crushed ice, maybe not, but everything else, however you like it, I'd say. Yeah. It's just, it's how, whatever is best for you. Like for me personally, I started on the rocks, then started to like neat more afterwards. And it's, even with water, like if you add the right amount, you can bring out different flavors. Mm. If you add just a little bit, you'll see the oil come up to the top mm. and adds a totally different layer to it. Interesting. It separates the oil from the water. Yeah. That's in there already. Oil in the water. And All yeah. right, so the second one, the Nomad, sorry, I'm just jumping ahead. in. Uh, this one is actually really, really powerful. Yeah. Like, like it's almost twice as powerful as the Glenmorey. Flavor-wise? or Flavor-wise, yeah. yeah. I mean, they're, they're both whiskey in the same range of alcohol, so, I mean, it's not that, that's the difference, right? Yeah, so what, just, like, what are you tasting in it? Like, what, what flavor in particular? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It leaves you with a sherry cask. At the end of it, it really does. It does. That's, I mean, it, it works. It delivers on what yeah. it says it's going to do for one's you. A, this one's a port finish. This one's a cherry, a sherry finish. Makes sense. Interesting. Yeah. So that's the the finishing touch. Is like there, it's the last one they use. Yeah. Is there a specific way to drink it? How so? Like when you see wine people, you know, they go, oh, okay. Look at it and they swirl yeah. it around and, and then they the, go. <laughs> there might be. I'm just a guy who enjoys whiskey at home. But for me personally, I learned about the this thing called the Kentucky Chew. The Kentucky Chew. Yeah. So this is an American way to do it. Yeah. But, what you're supposed to do is take a sip, let it sit in your mouth, and then wait four seconds, coat your tongue entirely, mm. and then swallow it. Mm. Then take a small sip afterwards, because that'll get rid of most of the alcohol burn, but allow you to taste the flavors more. Okay. I guess that's worth a shot. And time for sip number two. I think I need to practice this a little bit more. <laughs> oh, and the technique? <laughs> yeah. Oh, but okay. You, you, you like practicing things over and over again, right? Yeah, I do. Down. There's nothing wrong with practicing <laughs> drinking whiskey, I'll tell you that. 
I felt like I kind of made up my own technique at one point. How's that? So it looks like it. Okay. This is the Nick Pettis version of how yeah. to drink whiskey, right? You take a sip, close your mouth. Okay. And then drink it from the back of your throat. Of course, you're going to drink it from the back. What do you, you know what I'm trying to say? I feel like I'm going to choke if I try that. Yeah, no, no, no. If you don't, like, you're not doing this. Yeah. You're getting it in and you're pushing it back and then you just kind of swallow. And instead of breathing in when you open your mouth, okay. you breathe out. So you're blowing air into it almost. Yeah, because if you let a breath out really slowly, then you can just, it comes into your mouth and it just opens up really well. Okay. Um, I'll try I shall that. I'll demonstrate my technique. Okay. This is the naked wash first. Mm hmm. And you taste it on the on the when you breathe out then? Yeah. Okay. It comes out really good. Right. Anyway, this is what I figured out worked work for me. Definitely got yeah, that sherry comes out a lot more that way. Right? Yeah. It works, right? Yeah, I, I like wanted that. something there. Yeah, yeah. I think I want something. Yeah, scientific method, man. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Trial and error for sure. For sure. So we've been talking a little bit about the difference between the the American whiskeys yeah. and, and the, the bourbon and stuff like that. Do we happen to have anything? Yes. That... If you want to try some bourbon. Yeah. I brought something that I think is a bit of an interesting bottle here. Ooh, okay. Some nice Henry McKenna 10-year bottled in bond. Yeah. Not bottled exactly a looker, but it's a fun one. I noticed that you actually go for the bottles that are not so fancy. Yeah. Why it's... is that? Because I mostly read forums online about what's good and what's not, rather than picking it out in the store. Bit of a nerd about it, but science, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> research, yeah. But yes, that's speaking of which, that's an interesting story for that one because um, we're talking about the laws. This one is numbered. Yeah, yeah, they have to do that. <laughs> it's actually U.S. government uh, approved and sealed. Wow. So that's the idea. You see the way it says bottled and bottled and bond on it. Yeah. So what that means is that the U.S. government locked it up. Verify that it was locked up for 10 years and the same person was in charge of it for all 10 years, the same master distiller. Mm -hmm. And then they can say it's bottled and bond because back in the day, a lot of whiskey companies used to cheat and lie about how old it was, what right. it was. Government well, so there's guarantee. your proof. Oh, that's cool. So are we going to try this one? Let's go for it. And also beyond this one, this is some of the joys of being in Japan. So in America, this is very hard to find mm -hmm. because in 2018, this was thirty dollars. Yeah, and then well, actually, uh, should we clear out these glasses first? I think or? we should. Twelve seconds later. Good. So let's try it. I'm really yeah. excited actually that they have a system that actually ensures yeah. your quality, right? Yeah. It's like the Japanese wagyu. Whoa, exactly. Whoa. Can we share that? Yeah, let's share that. Let's pour <laughs> that one over. That's a bit. <laughs> nice fifty percent or two. This is like a fifty percent alcohol. Yeah, fifty percent right? alcohol. Yeah. And so the crazy story behind this one, why it's fun to get in Japan, is in America it's almost completely gone. It's hard to find because in 2018, it was $30 and won Best Bourbon in America in the San Francisco um, Wine and Spirit Contest. Nice. In 2019, it came back and won the best whiskey in the world. Oh, okay. As a $30 bottle. Yeah. The price is not $30 anymore. <laughs> no, definitely not. So and you brought the good stuff on the yeah. show. So in Japan, we can still find that it's around 60 bucks, nothing too bad. Mm. But in America, good luck, so we should enjoy it while we're here, man. <laughs> well, on that note, this is going to be the first Cheers. bourbon we're having here. Good, we can sell it. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Oh, yeah. That's good, but that's bourbon. Yeah. Oh, nice it's so smoky different. flavor, yeah. It's like it's like beer and, and Coke almost. <laughs> like, it's yeah. that different, right? Yeah. Interesting. We should have some cigars or something. <laughs> <laughs> Put on that health image. <laughs> wow. No, no, it's fine. Uh, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm really? all for um, nice. sustainable fitness, actually. Oh. Yeah, it's like you, you, you age that? like a wine, you know, okay. or a whiskey. And then yeah. the older you go, the more, you know, mature you get. I see. And then the more in tune with your life you can be. So Got there's nothing, it. Okay. nothing wrong with drinking alcohol. But perfect. Um, Happy I'm to hear actually, that. Yeah, I'm actually uh, very much for it. Perfect. Why not? Um, people are always stressed out, you know. I think that uh, to reinvent what fitness is really about, this is some, a big project of mine that I'm in, in, in the middle of, is to like, try to get people to understand that um, your body should be seasonal. Okay. 
summer, winter, spring, autumn, you know, four Got seasons. It. You okay. in four different moods with the with the with the continent and the world kind hmm. of, you know. Springtime, you're free. You want to <laughs> jump and frolic, right? Yeah. Summertime, you want to go to the beach, you mm-hmm. want to be, you know, swimming and and enjoying the different summer where it's a different kind of body, right? Yeah, yeah. Autumn, you know, you're starting getting ready for the long slumber of winter, you know. And so I think it should be seasonal like and that. Do that all in one year? Every year? Yeah, kind of? like a whole year. There's going to be a flow to it, you know. Okay. And, and I also believe I like that, that the older you get, the more yeah. like wise you should become about your life and what the choices are. Yeah. And what is fitness? Like for you, I will ask you this. Okay. What is fitness for you? For me, it is the ability to stay like still functional. Mm. For me, I lost a lot of my fitness when I moved to Japan because I stopped doing jujitsu as much because I couldn't find a gym over here that I could really work with because my Japanese was so bad I couldn't understand anything they were telling me. Mm. So that took a while. And then getting into other gyms just took me a while too. So I just lost so much. And then just going about daily life. Right. It's I struggled. Yeah. Like a simple things like just picking up backpacks. I felt uncoordinated. I felt slow. I felt just lethargic. But for me now, I've been really focusing on like kettlebell exercises, balance, dynamic movement kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And I feel as though I've gotten so much coordination back, so much more life quality back from that. Cool. And for me, that's what it comes down to. I just want more function, more use of my body and not waste it while I'm still young. Well, so I actually came out with a book that says "Live to or Train to, to to Live to 100." Okay, tell me about it in, in Japanese, and, and so um, we're trying to say that into English. Tomonashi, please, have <laughs> it will come, and we will talk about it again for sure. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no. So, so for me, because I went from a amateur mm-hmm. uh, karate kid to a professional fighter, and I spent yeah. you know three decades of training and fighting and training to fight. Mm-hmm. And so for me, fitness was to fight. Yes, it I was see. my means to how to fight. It was like the, yeah. the the engine work and the stamina work and all the skill and everything. It was for one very yeah. specific purpose. So I, I trained a lot. Mm-hmm. I ran a lot. I yeah. lifted a lot. And you know, just everything was a lot. But it was never for the sake of it. No, itself. no, and I didn't enjoy yeah. it. It's like it's, it's work. <laughs> yeah, like, for me, it was work. Nine to know? five. Yeah. Yeah, you, you know, you have to stay in shape. You never know when the phone's gonna call. Oh, we want you to fight next month, <laughs> or we want you to fight next week. Sometimes, you know, wow. so you've got to be in shape all the time. Wow. And it's very stressful on the body. So it's like, how fit do you need to be, right? Yeah. Uh, for this. And then, so anyway, um, I, my hips wore out and then I found fitness yeah. again. And then I realized over the years here, especially over the last uh, almost 10 years now with mm-hmm. CrossFit, that it has to be functional. I see. Like, I don't need to chase that more one more rep. Yeah. For example, bench press a couple months ago, got this big, strong kid in the gym mm-hmm. coming in, you know, when there was bench press on the program. Okay. And so, you know, we're repping out. And I was like, yeah, I'll just jump in with him. <laughs> you know, I haven't done bench press in years. Yeah, you don't have to rotate the weights out. You're fine. No, I'm, yeah. I'm okay. So, we're, you know, we're, we're going up, you know, mm-hmm. 60, 70, 80, 90. Yep. Well, all right, now it's we're 100 <laughs> kilos. Like, okay, I'm, now it's getting heavy, right? <laughs> so we put up, you know, 110. You know, I was like, yep, got it up. Yeah. No big deal. I'm looking at him. Now it's fun, right? <laughs> and now it's fun because it's like you know come on who's gonna win yeah competition right? going yeah. yeah so it was exactly. a friendly competition on the best yeah, race. yeah anyway put 115 on he bails i mean he fails on it right okay i finish it and he's just so disappointed in himself this is young blood you know like yeah. 22 25 something like that i don't yeah. know you broke the ego right, Big, there, right? yeah and then so he goes back tries 115 fails again i put 120 on and i lifted it right and i haven't been stressed in years okay but I've, I've kept myself fit yeah. with doing different things. So I think that when you're young, if you have the, the foundation and the challenge to actually build strength, mm-hmm. you can maintain it a lot easier. Oh, yeah. Once you get over that plateau, it's much easier to maintain muscle than gain it. Yeah. As so, uh, For me, personally, I'm a hard gainer. I have so much trouble like actually gaining any muscle mass, any weight. Right. So for me, that's always been the, the, the struggle. So like, if I gain weight and even get fat, it's easier for me to retain the muscle afterwards. Yeah. But oh man, yeah. it's not coming off. It, it, <laughs> but but I'm also at a point now where it's like, okay, I know what fitness is. Yeah. It is functional and it's sustainable it's and it's enjoyable. Life, yeah. Those are the three pillars for me. So when you say functional, what what's the functionality you're gaining out of it? I would like to be able to walk on my hands if I want to. Okay. I would like to be able to play soccer with my kid my kids or anyone's yeah. kids for the matter of it, just for okay. the fun of it. I would like to be able to say, Hey man, we're gonna go do a Spartan race. Do you wanna come? Yeah. Got it. Don't be afraid of, yeah. of the challenge that you can. And I have two hip, uh, you know, hip replacements. Yeah. So, but then, so yeah, that uh, that pillar of being functional is that you're able to do things that you want. Uh, last year, I went on a 560 kilometer bicycle ride Oof. with no training for it whatsoever. It took us a week, but we crushed it out, and I was fine. I loved it. You were functionally fit. You were ready to adapt to a new challenge. And absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Perfect. 
And then it has to be sustainable in, in the sense that right, when I'm chasing one more rep, for example, mm-hmm. that's injury land. Yeah, when you try and push out the last one, your form gets bad. The, yeah. Why am I? Why am I trying to lift heavier than yeah. the young young bloods in the gym? It's like, <laughs> I don't need it. Yeah. So my mission in life, I know we're talking about me again here. Sorry, but my mission in life is to become this new new kind of leader for people in their 40s and 50s, and, and just like look at look at me to inspire people because there's yeah. so many people worldwide, especially after COVID. They got hit with not being able to work out. And then they got that COVID 15 pounds that everyone yeah. gained. I lost 10 kilos uh, during the COVID on purpose. It was wow. hilarious. No, I wanted to show and lead by example yeah. at that time. I was like, you know what? I'm going to eat two meals a day and I'm going to do my online pro- program with everyone else. And I'm going to yeah. prove that if you do it right, you get results. And that's what I bought into too as well, personally. Like when COVID hit, my gym's closed down. I had nowhere to go, nothing nothing to do. So I just went and bought kettlebells and just focused on working out at home. And I'd see them every day. Okay, got to do this. I have no choice. Time to work out. Keep it going. Make sure that I'm actually not losing during this time when everyone else is. Right. Yeah. Who did your programming for the kettlebells? Is it just random? I just followed Pavel. Uh, test. I can never say his last name. Yeah. <sighs> that guy. Yeah. <laughs> Pavel. Pavel. <laughs> He's strong first. A- right. Enter the kettlebell. Right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. They're cool. What's your favorite technique in the kettlebell? Turkish get up. No oh. question. <laughs> not, uh. Okay, if you don't know what a Turkish get up, please just go and check it. Or maybe Dumb Final Media can put a thing in there. Just trust me, they're horrible, but they're perfect. They get everything. They're so simple, like in yep. the in the because they hit everything. Every single muscle. Way better than burpees, by the way. Exactly, and it's all the balance too, as well. Like that's the worst part about it. It's like all that stabilizing muscle while you're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen a guy do it with. I think it was a hundred kilo barbell. Oh my god. Uh, yeah. I think it was like cloak off. <laughs> <laughs> that guy's nuts, man. That's something else. Yeah, I've seen guys like wrap their girlfriends around their arms and just like stand up with them. Also, I've seen a lot of funny stuff. With I got that. a long way to go, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, have you done the uh, have you done the FBI test? The what? The FBI test. No, it's a fitness test for the FBI. It's a okay. five minute max reps for uh, kettlebell swings. Really? They're Russian swings, by the way. Okay. With a thirty two kilo bell. That with sounds a, fun. With a two pood. Huh? Yep, it's called poods. Oh. Do you know that? No. They're not actually called kilos. So 16 kilos is one pood. Okay. Two poods is 32 kilos. I did not learn the Russian method okay, here. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, they're they're really cool. Yeah. What do you feel is the, like, for example, like, so American swing, Russian swing. American, American swing. swing goes all the way over yeah. your head, right? You're getting full extension. Yeah. Um, you know, the Russian style of doing is like small, just hip yeah, just, extension. Yeah, just straight out pretty much. Yeah, but yeah. it's all about the hip First, right, I decided to learn from Pavel, so it's the Russian method, but yeah. <laughs> also that, like, yeah, the, so you're also <laughs> engaging that, yeah. your breath and everything. Exactly. Yeah. And the other one I try and do personally is rather than doing two arm swings, I like to do one arm rotate so I can constantly keep myself off balance, keep the core strength going. Yeah. That's my main focus. Jiu-Jitsu, of course, too, is almost all core strength, so I keep trying to work on that off balance mm. and try and bring it back in. But as we said, like, it's functional. Yeah. I'm an amateur. I have no reason to push myself to some crazy level, so. You don't need it. Yeah. Like, why would you? Exactly. Like if you're if you're also training a sport, you know, and and you you're doing you know fitness just to supplement that exactly. and stay strong and healthy. That's you you're doing it right. So that's why I try and do the road, the alternating because I figure core strength helps with everything. I can show off and show how much I can do from a two arm swing, but then also have to buy more kettlebells, cost more money. Yeah, <laughs> doesn't grow on trees, you know. So how many kilos do you have? Of, how many bells do you have? I have at home six. Oh, so that's oh, a only, real only up to only up to twenty though. Uh, not, not that high, mostly low weight stuff. But you know, you could do uh, double handed too. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I've got I've got in the sets that are my right weights. I got the two, and then in the other ones, I got just one kettlebell and just nice. Yeah. My favorite is the one arm snatch, the hang snatch, the one where you just you pop it up and yep. catch it overhead. When when you get that movement right, the yep. f- because in the beginning people smack their wrists with it and it hurts. Well, like is that with the what is it the competition style or are you using the? I don't know what it is. I'm not. Yeah. Is it, is it the, the one like every single one's the same width? Or no? The, the bell? The bell, yeah. Yeah. So they're all exactly the same width, no matter what. Ah, uh, okay. No. Yeah. So that's what I found out, because I used to smack my wrist so badly with those. Ah, interesting. When yeah, I was yeah, trying yeah. the, when it was like lower weights, because it, it was different, so you have a lot more distance to cover. Right. With the competition style ones, they're so much wider. Hi, hi. There's much less movement to move, and it's always the same amount it's going to move. Interesting. So it made it, made it easier. I still get smacked all the time, but not that's as bad. That's why they have those, what, they're all the same size. Exactly. The pink ones and the, and exactly. the blue ones and yeah, stuff yeah. like that. Oh, I didn't even know that. Oh, you learn something new every day. That's kind of cool. Yeah, no, I just like the I like the, the fluid, uh, fluidity of the movement. I like the way okay. it feels when you're catching it up there. And yeah. you can do, I could do it with a 24 or 32 or, you know, I, even, I got, <laughs> no, there was a time because like being a CrossFit coach, I felt like I had to immerse myself into various areas of CrossFit. And yeah. obviously kettlebell swings was a big thing of that. Of course. And so I went through this, this long period of a kettlebell swing. So we bought one, which I called the Juggernaut. It's a 48 kilo bell. <laughs> And man, that thing, that's like swinging your girlfriend. Like, 
<laughs> that's nuts. My God, that's crazy. Yeah, you should come and uh, play with a juggernaut next time. <laughs> Down for that. That sounds like fun. Let's see if I can even get off the ground. <laughs> yeah. Well, we teach uh, we teach the movement uh, to beginners, obviously. Most people don't understand. They don't understand like the correlation of keeping your back straight, pushing your hip back, yeah. and getting full hip extension. Exactly. Making sure it's more of the lever method rather than just the bent. It's true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah, because you have to be able to afford those kettlebells, right? Sorry? We have to be able to afford them. They're expensive, aren't they? Uh, well, you know, for me, it's it's a cost that I have <laughs> to think about, you know. True. But, uh, but um, one piece of advice, if I yeah. had to sell anyone, is like you don't have to go heavier. Oh, yeah, yeah. You could go more volume with lighter weights and just work on the skill. Of course, yeah. I prefer, like, everything I do, even with Olympic lifting, I don't try yeah. to lift heavy anymore. You know, I was squatting the other day, and it was just like 60, 70, 80, 90 a hundred, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm done." <laughs> <I'm good. laughs> a hundred kilos. Like, think about that on my back, it's going up and down. And it, for me, that's not heavy. Yeah, but I'm like, it's heavy enough. I'm happy with it. You know, get the, stay get the strength training. Yeah, yeah. Come back the next day. Yeah. No, the moment we've all been waiting for. All right. Because now I think we're going to go into a deep dive. Okay, that brings on, away from me, so I stay focused. Yeah, you should definitely stay focused, okay. guys. This is where we're going to learn to come become millionaires. <laughs> millionaires, maybe not overnight, but hopefully. Um, so let's go into the history of the Bitcoin. Okay, Bitcoin first, all right. Satoshi, who is this legendary man? Programmer, that's all we know. Did Programmer from a, from a forum. That's all we know about him. Yeah? Yeah. So what was the story back in the day with this other dude that bought his credits? There was the whole like conspiracy going on in the beginning. Yeah, about who it was, whether it was actually Satoshi Nakamoto or not. If it was based on the idea of the name of Satoshi Nakamoto or if it was just someone else trying to use a pseudonym to get away with not being recognized because the original Bitcoins that the founder still has have never moved. Huh. We can see where they are because that's the great thing about the Bitcoin space. We can track where everything is. Right. We can't see who has it. His we just know because of the founders. Yeah. We don't know where their access or how that would move. But we can see that his haven't. So you could see where all the coins are. Sort of. There's the ledger. So we can see the transactional history of where what's moved to where. We don't know what anything is. We just see that wallet to that wallet. Oh, okay. We have no tie as to whose wallet that is, what it is, unless you give that information away. All right. And with him, since he's the founder, we know what it is originally. And we can see that his haven't moved. But what does that mean? He's not cashed out yet. <laughs> he's still holding. <laughs> oh, okay. Interesting. So he... What if he cashed out now? Would he... Uh, what would he stand to make? I don't know. Oh. Um, off the top of my head, I, that is look up, I, that is access, accessible, but I don't know it off the top of my head personally. Right. I know it's quite a fortune, but yeah. the problem is also cashing out as well, of course, too. He can't just exactly exchange it perfectly for cash. No? You have to have, it, it's an exchange still. It's a bartering system. Someone has to be able to sell it to you, buy it. Like you, you need for to have cash. an exchange mm. that's going to make this happen. He can't just all of a sudden be like, okay, I don't want it anymore. He needs to be able to sell it to someone still. Someone has to be willing to pay that cash. That's where the price comes from. Right. And then it's about finding the person willing to buy it, who he'd sell it to, because personally for him, there's a lot of politics involved, I'd imagine, mm. as a founder. So there's but a lot we of don't know involved. who the founder is? No. We it's don't. It's so bizarre. And that's the opposite <laughs> from Ethereum. Ethereum, we knew everything about how it was built. Yeah. We know it was the MIT guys. They still have this. the... What's Ethereum? Ethereum. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, let's talk about cryptocurrency. So we've got Bitcoin yeah. was the first ever cryptocurrency okay. that we know of that mm. has been published and is part of the ethos now. Ethereum came later. It was designed to be more functional, more based on the programmability of it, what you could do with it. Mm. And that was created by a group of people consortium that are still working with it today. Mm. Not the exact same team, but a lot of the same guys. And every year they come back, talk about it. They have hard forks, they change up. They have a lot of other tokens that can work on their platform. Mm -hmm. So theirs ends up being more of its own economy. Bitcoin's more along the sense of like gold. It's a reserve that there's only that set amount that we're going to work with. Mm. We don't know where it came from gold. Like, right, it just it's in the earth. It's a thing. We, we find it, but we just know how much there is now mm. for Bitcoin. And... In that sense, it's... So you run out of Bitcoin at one point? Yeah. We know exactly what date it'll run out and we know how many there will be. It's all programmed in there. It's all already programmed. That's just running. It's the, He set up the program. Now it's just running by itself because all the people that are mining it are getting paid in it. So all the people doing the computing power to keep it moving forward are getting paid in the same the same currency as they're working for. Oh my God, you completely lost <laughs> me there. It's <laughs> like imagine if every single gold miner got to keep the gold they mined according to what percentage of work they did towards it. Who are these miners? These are computers. Computers? That people own. 
So how, what? How do I do this? How do I, how do I buy Bitcoin then? What do I do? <laughs> well, to buy Bitcoin, you can either buy it through an exchange oh. or you can mine it yourself. However, good luck with that. There's very little money in it if you don't have like your own giant factory rig pretty much. I don't understand this. What do you mean mine it yourself? So mining it means that you are actually doing the calculations for the transference of a Bitcoin from one place to another. Your computer is solving all the algorithm and all the calculations that are needed to send it from one place to another. Hmm. And for doing that, depending on how much work you put towards it and how much Bitcoin is given out of that given time, you get that certain amount. So in essence, you're, you're mining for zeros and ones? Pretty much. It's, yeah, it's all calculations, it's all binary eventually. Why, doesn't, why can't you just make a program that mines it all? Because you need the computing power to solve it. It's, it's all an algorithm. You have to solve the problem. A computer can only work on it so fast and do so much work. So you have to spread the load. Huh. amongst lots of computers and depending on how much work you put towards solving it you get paid that percentage back why doesn't like some you know i don't know government let's say the american government has a supercomputer go in and just like mine it all then because they would have that, the... that, that kind of supercomputer doesn't exist yet no no we can't do that and governments have gotten involved tried to make their money off it china just outlawed mining bitcoin so now all of a sudden the ability to mine it's become more profitable like china used to be the main miner of it they just outlawed mining of it a few weeks ago the price crashed of course from that Wow. But it also makes mining more profitable now because you have less competition. Huh. I it's still not profitable enough for a person to do by themselves. Yeah. So it's it's it, it's a so when you're sending it from one point to another, there's yeah. a calculation in place. So you need to get the wallet, the existence of the bitcoins, and then the other wallet. And I'm explaining this to the best of my knowledge. Of course, I'm not a computer programmer. Yeah. But you need to solve the equation between the two points. And you're getting paid for solving that. Mm -hmm. And every single computer that's on the network is contributing to that. How many computers are on the network? A bunch. I, a lot? Yeah, yeah a lot. <laughs> Personally, don't know that. Okay, it just feels like I have more questions than answers here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> But so, the, the whole thing is like the technical aspect of it. The idea is now it's decentralized. You, like, there's not one government that can control this. Mm. It's a network that's a bunch of people all individually contributing to it. So in that sense, we have something completely outside of control of government, any kind of interference that's running on its own. And we know exactly how many there are going to be, how much, it, and um, how many have already been mined at any given time. And with that, we can assume. Are you sure the mining word is the right phrase to use here? That's the word that's used. Okay. It's the one that is, but it's. Maybe it's, it's throwing me a little bit off because okay. I don't understand how you can be out there mining like computer <laughs> programs against each other. Yeah, it's um, but that, that's the, I, I think I don't know exactly, but I believe the idea was like if a gold miner could keep the gold they they pulled out of yeah. their mine. Yeah, but think about it. Worker. I mean, I can I can wire money like directly from my mm -hmm. phone to your phone uh, over an email, like for example PayPal or something. Exactly. So why is the, the bitcoins have to be mined? I don't understand. PayPal's this. taking a cut. Yeah. PayPal's involved. It's all traced. Uh. Bitcoin is something outside of that. There's no other organization. So the people actually putting it from point A to point B and calculating it are individuals. They're oh. not some organization. Oh, okay, got it. So the cut. Ah, so it's completely just between. Yeah. Well, okay, okay. So it's okay. Now I'm seeing the picture. Yeah. <clears throat> There's no central organization. It's all peer to peer. It's pure, all pure, pure trading amongst whatever you would call these gentlemen and ladies. Exactly. Yeah. What does a Bitcoin cost? Right now, it's ooh, somewhere around one Bitcoin is somewhere around thirty-three thousand dollars, I believe. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Hold up, hold up, hold up. Hey guys, Dumb Fan and Media here. So we actually shot this back in July, and since then crypto has gone up again. So oh, I'll leave a chart down here for you to see what I'm talking about. Anyway, from this we can take away two things. One, cryptocurrencies are incredibly volatile. And two, Nolan is probably not from the future, unless he's bluffing, in which case uh, let's keep watching for clues. Last I saw today? 33,000 for one coin. Yeah, for one coin. But you can break it down to one Satoshi. What? Which is... <laughs> one Satoshi? Which is, I believe... Uh, I can't remember that how much it's... sounds like... A, it's, it sounds it's, like yeah. a Mario. Exactly. <laughs> we'll break it into some Super Marios. <laughs> so that's the lowest form it can be. And then I forget how much it says. I think it's point zero zero like nine zeros and then a one. Yeah. So you can break it down to that level so you can deal with like in dollars and cents of it. Do you like know how many low. total coins there are? How many total coins right now currently? Like, like full coins well yeah yeah uh, we can look that up i don't oh. know off the top of my head but that's public information right now we can find that out okay we don't know if all of them are in existence or all of them still are there some might be lost some might be in corrupted drives
recently someone like yeah. passed away and like they, they didn't have this password to be yeah. something it was like 20 million dollars worth of it or something so that's all locked away now oh my that, those god. coins are no longer part of the network oh my god <laughs> so i mean your value go up there but at the, uh, that at would mean value loss. goes up for you personally because there's less than the network people believe that's there but then we don't know how much is actually accessible oh. supply and demand the, de- the supply gets smaller then oh. yeah however i will say that bitcoins are not my exact area of expertise mm. like the actual calculations is much more about like the economic impact you can get from that right so the idea is it's how valuable it is to someone else okay and that's constantly being decided, which is why it's so volatile, because it's not something you can hold in your hand and people don't quite get it yet. Yeah. And there's so many applications. And there's also Ethereum, where you can actually get proper function out of these tokens. Mm. Like you can get decentralized finance, like rather than having to go to a bank for a, for a loan, you can do it through cryptocurrency hmm. for your small business at a very small amount. And then everyone else gets to keep the interest rate that lent them to you. Oh. So decentralized finance in that sense. So that's there's value cool. there, yeah. And there's all these different applications from all these different coins. And the thing that people are doing is they're speculating. They're guessing how important it'll be and how much people will be willing to pay for in the future. Mm. And so they're finding their favorites, buying them, and then assuming what the what the direction is in the intention that it'll go up. So that's where the idea of becoming a Bitcoin millionaire comes from. Right. People saw this application back when it was like $500. Personally, I saw it when it was around $100. Uh-huh. And I didn't buy it I'm like a fool. <laughs> <laughs> no? Nope. <laughs> I was, did you wish you had? Oh, every day. <laughs> every day I wish I did. I discovered it, then I thought it was the greatest thing. I'm like, oh, this seems so complicated to have to do. I had no money. I was a college student. Oh, no. Yeah. No, that's like... Exactly. And that's the whole thing. Is like, it's trusting your gut on that one, figuring out what these things are and speculating on it. Right. And honestly, I didn't know enough to know what the full value would be. And that's why I keep looking into this more. And the other one that's becoming big now is soon you can start buying a part of a Bitcoin or pieces of Bitcoin through the New York Stock Exchange. Oh. Yeah. I, or it might be actually NASDAQ. I forget which one it's listing on. Yeah. But there's going to be ETFs for it. Huh. So you can buy it through a giant financial organization huh. as you would a normal stock. Right. And have a piece of that and still get the same speculative idea. Rather than having to actually own the coin, it kind of lets down the purpose. Right. But it allows people to get involved in the idea more easily. Ah, uh, okay, for them to have a more, I don't know, yeah, but I mean, a more safe way to use the stock exchange. and Yeah, the only problem is then, of course, you don't own it yourself, so that lets down that side. You don't have this thing that the government doesn't doesn't have control over, which right. people claim has value. Okay, so I'm, starting to both warm up to, though, I'm starting to warm up to this yeah. idea about just owning a couple just for the fun of it. Well, a couple. Not, not, not a couple full ones, a couple Satoshis. Yeah. I, I, I can send you like a Satoshi or two, no problem. <laughs> cool. But so your 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 own podcast is about financing and stuff. What is it that you actually talk about there apart from mostly it's about like the actual methodology behind finance, like what people have actually done in the past and how they made their bets. Yeah. So you have to view finance like poker. Okay. Now you, I'm interested. You I have like a poker. little bit of information. Yeah. You just see what everyone else can, but you can't see what's actually inside that company. You can't tell what other people think it's worth. Mm. You don't know what other people think of your hand. So if it's Texas Hold'em, right? You have your two cards. Yeah. You know what they are. Yeah. You have that little bit of information about that company. Mm. There's more that's going to come out as time goes on. Mm. And you don't know what other people think of it. And it's how much are you willing to bet to be able to see that next card and think it's going to, your value is going to go up. Right. And so that's the gambling sense of it. It doesn't necessarily matter what someone else has against you in a basic sense. Mm. More advanced than yeah. But the idea is how much are you willing to pay and someone else is willing to make you have to pay to see that flop, to see that river turn, whichever part of it. Yeah. And that's where the fun of that comes in is is you can actually expand your information beyond two cards mm. with finance and with the stock market. You can keep looking deeper, have personal knowledge. Like for you personally, you work in CrossFit, you work in martial arts formerly and you work in now social media yeah so all those platforms are things you understand very well <laughs> hopefully <laughs> i totally understand that feeling too <laughs> but say for like example but the more you know the more you less the, the less you think you know i, I just I don't know there's this, this evil yes. looping oh. thing like the more you understand like yeah. oh but what about you know it always opens up another door so there's a i thought i was good process. at science until i went to college yeah then i learned how dumb i was <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is more humbling than working on a problem for hours and the professor solving it in two seconds and showing you just like, yep, okay, I see where my capability is in this scale. Oh, is man. that what, the Dunning-Kruger effect? Humbling, humbling. Yeah, the Dunning-Kruger effect. The Dunning-Kruger? I think, right? Yeah. The idea that, yeah, over time, as you learn more, you realize 
how dumb you are. Yeah. <laughs> and then eventually you'll become a master of it. But yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd hope though, but back to the original point is like for something like CrossFit. Yeah. So once Reebok bought them out. They didn't buy them out. Or created? How, how did that no, work No, exactly? they just sponsored them. Sponsored, okay. Yeah. And that contract ended. Uh, it was a 10-year contract. That was okay. when I got signed as an ambassador. Yeah. So 10 years ago. Okay. And they just finished this year. And uh, got now it. they're they're out. Yeah. Of course, okay. it is a corporation. Uh, it used to be owned by one man and I his see. wife. Yeah. And then they got... Yeah. into trouble and <laughs> there was a lot of money going on there and then See now that, it's, yeah. yeah someone else bought the company recently actually okay. from that guy um, uh, from Greg Glassman so now it's uh, owned by an, another guy called Eric uh, Nosa okay and uh, he used to be a tech guy but okay. also a crossfitter as a uh, yeah as a passion yeah as a passion yeah. and an athlete and stuff like that and so yeah. he's really pushing a direction uh, a new direction for the whole company I think it's great because okay. it's a it's a person who loves crossfit yeah who actually had enough money to buy the whole company <laughs> <laughs> when we perfect. needed it the most and that's that's an investing idea like he yeah. knows it personally he knows it intimately yeah. so that's a, that would be the idea is he knows what the value is there so he bought into it yeah he sees something and he knows how much more he can expand it to make money off of it yeah so if you were in it say before Reebok got in you would know Reebok's value would go up from being involved with it. It so you'd be able to be all the right yeah. buy Reebok stock, yeah. get involved in that, and sell your Reebok stock before CrossFit left. Reebok's being sold yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. So, but that's the idea of it. It's all about the idea to see where new pieces are coming and using your own personal information. Right. So for me personally, I work in semiconductors, so like I have a lot of feeling for that yeah. of like what the most important tools are, who's going to be, who's being undervalued, who's having some issues right now, and being able to. Not insider trading because that's illegal. Where you have special information that the outside world doesn't have. It's much more that I'm in tune to what is important. Right. Like with you are with fitness. Like you don't have inside information on it. No. You just know how great CrossFit is, how it should be able to spread, and those kinds of ideas. You, well, you have an idea. Exactly. It's not gold. It's not perfect. When we first started, it's interesting to talk because you know, as a business, you know, we started uh, in 2013. Yeah. And we were the second box in Japan. Wow. And that's so awesome. that time, CrossFit had just bought into uh, yeah. Yeah, to the sponsorship of, of yeah Reebok. Just bought into the sponsorship, and it was like they was like excited about having. They went from what was it, sixteen hundred affiliates worldwide to three two thousand seven hundred in like a year. Wow! Of sponsorship, so they they, they bounced up with, and they, they pushed it to a thousand more affiliates in, in the first year. That's amazing. And then I think it was five years later when they hit 10,000 affiliates. Okay. It was just like, it went, <laughs> but I knew it was coming. Yeah. It was just, we were, we were kind of deemed to be mission impossible in Japan. To try and get the Japanese market in? Because they're so muscular and strong and, and strong women and empowerment it was not really a thing in Japan I at the see. time. Okay. But I, I firmly believed in it. Um, and I and I worked it really hard, and we're we're doing knock on wood pretty good now. And you put your money towards it, right? Oh, I put and everything into it, and that's the whole thing. more than the money. <laughs> so that's the idea. So this is my favorite thing: is the idea of the Dondo investor. Mm. This is my favorite by um, I can't ever say his name properly. Munesh Pabrai. Mm. His idea was when you know something well, and it's either t- heads I win, tails I don't lose much. So the whole idea was that you knew something about this, and you could bet big on it. You could go for the full amount, and knowing this is my area of expertise. I have a better idea of what the outcome is going to be than something else. And then you really put your ability into that expertise. Yeah. So it was a gamble in a sense, correct? Uh, I never believed it was a gamble, but also my whole family was riding on it. So I was exactly. like, you know, I'm going to work it or, or die trying. Exactly. <laughs> so it was a gamble where you felt comfortable with the risk. Oh, absolutely. And that's the whole thing. So you put everything you had towards it. And it's all about betting big on what you know will work. Yeah. And never outclassing your risk in a way. Because your risk was still there, of course, mm-hmm. but you were aware of it. You knew how much was at risk for you, and you knew how likely you were to succeed. Right. And it's all about leaning into your expertise. That's why I think the main thing people miss about finance. They think you have to do it the same way people do on Wall Street. Yeah. You instead start a gym, mm. which has been a successful business for you, correct? Yeah. There's, someone on Wall Street knows nothing about that. True. If you were someone into video games, you would have known the Nvidia stock was worth way more than people were considering it because oh, you know yeah. how great the graphics cards were. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like all that, got, these kinds of ideas, it's like, where's your special expertise? And lean into it mm. and make bets in that space. So what would you suggest? What, what are you looking into right now, for instance, currently? What's going on in the market that currently, you feel comfortable with? Currently, right now in the market, I think that we are, of course, having more uh, fear, I guess, than usual. So the whole idea was, Warren Buffett always used to say, buy, buy fear, sell greed. Mm. Right now, the market's very afraid because of inflation, because of COVID, the Delta variant, all these kinds of ideas. Yeah. So it's all about trying to find somewhere where people are selling it because it's fearful, but you know the underlying is okay, like 10 years, 20 years down the line. We can't predict what's going to happen tomorrow. 
it's too difficult. But we can have a much better idea 10 years down the line that this company will be successful. Mm. So it's something you know well that you see a lot of fear around, I think is the best the best sale you can find right now. Right. And right now, things are very expensive. The market's up. Mm. But fear is high, so there's still those deals to be found in certain sectors. And it's all about just knowing your area of expertise, not thinking that, like, so for me personally, mm. I'm not going to go around buying hospitalities because that's an industry I don't personally understand. Right. I know my sector. I'm staying in that range mostly. So so it's, it's what are we looking at now <laughs> i'm not a financial advisor and i can't tell you what to put your money in but i think that the the main concept we have is to make sure that we are assessing our ops properly like avoiding things like fomo you know fear of missing out and right. seeing this stock go flying up that's when it's the, at the worst case because greed's high everyone thinks they're gonna make money on it don't buy that mm. find the thing that nobody else likes but you know there's something good there underneath it well, I mean, when you talk about it that way, yeah, this is this is what I start like my little engine inside my little head. It's very small, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> it, it starts ticking, right, and it's and it's going like, okay, well, what does the world look like right now? Because if we'd gone yeah. back a year, right, twenty twenty, go back and right before COVID, right, if we had invested money into some kind of mask building company, you know, those face masks, yep. we would be billionaires today. The crazy thing was 3M; they didn't do that well. No, the maker of the the um, the what is it ninety five and ninety five? Uh huh. Their stock did good. Oh no, well, well, that's not an interesting mask. Oh, it's all the other masks. Oh, you mean oh the smaller business that made their their stylish ones? Yeah, I stuff see. like that. Yeah. Oh man. But that's that's information that we can't have. But what else is going what on? We could COVID? have. What does though, COVID actually open up? So for? COVID took down the market, right? Right. And in March, we were at the lowest prices possible. Mm. That was the best chance to jump. Everyone was so afraid. No. Oh, okay. And you also had all these people like um, that were on margin and were leveraged. So that means that they're borrowing money from banks to invest it. As the price goes down, they have to start selling the assets they have. So when you had that giant crash, you had this extra effect on it that brought it down even more from all these people that were leveraged. Ooh. So that brought the price down to an even lower max. So typically what you'll see is when something drops, it drops hard. Right. And then we can start to see it stabilize and come back. So if, say, COVID came about, you knew that at home entertainment was going to be an all-time high or Peloton's another great example in the fitness space. Yeah. So Peloton did amazingly when COVID hit because their price fell with everything else, but everyone wanted at home fitness. Right. So that's a great time to invest in some of that because the fear is associated with everything. So it's touching that, but you can see why it wouldn't be associated the same and they have more potential out of it. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. It's, I mean, there's definitely yeah. whatever it is that happens in the world in war or peace or whatever yeah. it is, there's always somewhere that something can be leveraged. And predict, predicting macroeconomics is way beyond most people's pay grade. That is some difficult work. Right. And people still get it wrong, though, the experts on it. But reacting to it and figuring out what is the best long term and how people have overreacted to things currently, mm. a lot of money to be made. The most, the most money was made during 2020 mm. by all these financial institutions, all these hedge funds, because they saw it, they dumped money and they over levered at the bottom, got to ride the wave up. Wow. Like for me personally, even 2020 was by far my best financial year, <laughs> which is insane because I bought in big in January into just funds before we knew COVID was going to be a thing. Yeah. I just had some money lying around. I wanted to invest it. It all got hammered. But then it was all about rotating once it hit the bottom. Okay. So I have these things that didn't get hit that hard because they're stalwarts. They're, you know, industrial businesses. They'll be fine. Right. And then rotate them into tech mm. because we saw that tech was going to have a boom because everyone was working from home, Zoom calls, things oh, like yeah. that. Oh yeah, interesting. So it was the recognizing opportunity and then having the opportunity and not being emotional about it because I was terrified when I was rotating my money into these more risky stocks at the bottom. But I don't want to get my emotion involved. I think that's the main thing that people struggle with is separating emotion from finance. Mm. So for you, when you started the business, were you more, was it, was it like, how was your fear index? Would you say like on a scale of one to 10 when you started your gym, your box? <laughs> uh well fear no i wasn't fearful i didn't have any I didn't have any money oh okay uh for example we had zero marketing budget yeah like zero okay so i needed to be a little bit inventive on stuff like that <laughs> no i, I felt That's my awesome. personality would have pulled people yeah. in in the beginning but it wasn't really so okay so i chose a location very wisely uh, yeah. to get into a, a location where i could get a lot of the expats who actually had heard about crossfit got it except japan japanese had never heard of it and yeah. even though i was a reebok ambassador and they signed me to be you know to, to help promote them so mm -hmm. they never gave me any advertising really? with it or anything wow okay so i had to kind of figure out that and well, funny thing mm. is the thing that got the most business in the beginning was that we literally put a tv screen on the outside 
uh, and I would film what was going on in the classes inside and then yeah. edit those videos and put them on the TV screen outside. And people and kids would just stand there and watch it. And then it would dr draw people in, traffic yeah. in. So like, rather than taking in your pride, your emotion, the fact that you were the ambassador and you could draw people in, you started to rotate around that and realize what you could take advantage of, what you could lever. No, I was very driven, outside. you know, very driven. Like I, I knew I wanted, I yeah. wanted. I needed, <laughs> needed success. success. <laughs> yeah. I, I had to make it happen. And that's the whole thing. So you took yourself out of it emotionally and you just worked hard and figuring out what was best, right? Uh, you don't think so? You think you had the emotion going No, there? I was super emotional. Really? Super emotional. In your decision making or in, in everything, general? In everything. Okay. I actually made a, made a, um, I made a point out of becoming a, like personal friends with each and every member. Different kind of emotion, but <laughs> I hear that. Very yeah. important emotion. Yeah, that's a very important but emotion. But really taking care in these members. Which and, made you better customers. Yeah, yeah and so yeah. We, 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 and then from there on, once we had like 20, 25, I think, in the first couple of months, from there on, it was introductions. Okay. That people was like, yes, this guy's great. You know, yeah. he works with us really well. He's a great teacher. He's a great motivator. Okay. You know, the cross class is yeah. fun. It's like, so we, we offered a one month free membership if, if, if they... If they got a member to introduce a member that signed up, yeah. So I literally had a lady that um, that had a whole year uh, free. Wow! Like she didn't pay much. She just kept introducing new members. It was great. I loved it. Yeah, get new customers is better for <laughs> exactly. you. Exactly. Yeah. It was so brilliant. Worth it. So that was our marketing budget. Yeah. Like, introduce a friend and <laughs> get a free month membership. Month. Yeah, my gym's the same way. I'm actually, back home for jujitsu. <laughs> yeah, no, it really works. It does. It really works. Yeah, that's a so the idea of it financially though. So like yeah. that was a risk for you to take there as well too. But you realize that you could spread more. It's all. I think like the interesting thing is the way you view emotion. Like, that's the right kind of emotion. Like, yeah, connection yeah. with someone. I'm talking much more like you're afraid. So it's like, okay, so that means I have to spend less. I need to not take any risks. I need to make sure I hold on to the money I have. There was nothing new to customers. spend. <laughs> well, I mean, like, no, but I say you, you were risking with the new customers because you were giving them a month, a month free, right? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so you're risking that money for the potential new money and constantly doing that and trying to not be so afraid that you started to box yourself in. You mm. kept expanding and risking more in that sense. True, true, true. So you fought the bottom. You did it. You did it the right way. <laughs> yeah. Well, I yeah figured it out. I thought if I loved my members more than anyone else, then you know, except for my children, then they they would love me back. You leaned into your expertise right there. Then <laughs> I did. I did. It's true. Yeah. When you put it that way, there was there, were, there was a lot going on back mm -hmm. then. Exactly. I didn't really think about it that way. And you thought about what you knew. You leaned into that, and it's the same concept you can apply to just general finance on the stock market. Mm. And that's nice because where do you normally study the market? Like, what do you look at? Is there some site you go to or <sighs> my favorite personally or? is Seeking Alpha? It's it's simple. Seeking Alpha. Yeah, it's someone that a lot of people use. A lot of people write on there. It's just there's so much information you can find on there. You can find all the 10K filings from these companies if you are someone who wants to read through all the finance, figure out like if there's more money in the company than people realize, mm. or you can also read opinions of other experts. And then it's more not necessarily following the experts, but looking into things you know about. So there's this uh, great investor, Peter Lynch, one of the most successful of all time. And his idea was that he would look for investments in everyday life instead. Mm. So he went to Taco Bell. I like that food. I think I might invest in that, see how much it's worth. <laughs> and then he'd go on to like a website like, well, they didn't have that kind of information back then. They had books back then. But mm. today, go on Seeking Alpha, look into that company, see how their finances are, see what people are believing in them, what their forecast is, yeah, and try and do that instead. So it's first gather the information on what you think will succeed then go look into their actual company. Right. And try and then, so first have the emotional response, then try and take the emotion out and look at it coldly and see if, if you add both together, you like both. Mm. And then figure out your risk tolerance, how sure you are. How much should one invest? In? Like how much of a percentage of should one invest? Into what exactly? That's the question. Like, say, would would you do like a monthly like investment? A I chunk think of dollar your... cost averaging is the best way to do it because dollar cost averaging, where yeah. every single month you put in a bit to something yeah. rather than doing it all at once because the price fluctuates. Uh -huh. You might buy at the peak, you might buy at the valley. If you do it every single month, your odds are you'll get a decent price on it. Like on, on long term? Yeah. How long term are you thinking? Oh, for me personally, I'm thinking like towards my 60s kind of era. Oh, so you're going to leave it in there. But also for me personally, also in short term too because I have a kid that's hitting college soon. Oh, okay. So I have different funds for different amounts. So it's like where the whole idea is if you're going to invest money, know when you need to buy. Oh, okay. And how safe that investment is by that point. What if you're old and like don't me? And <laughs> <invest money, laughs> don't invest money you can't lose then. If you need that money tomorrow or the next day or something for some unforeseen reason, don't invest it. All Save right. it. Keep it. Keep how much you need to make sure you're okay for the next three months pretty much at least. Then start to work around how you can invest the money that you don't need right now for the future to be bigger and when you need it. Right. So the whole idea is like they have these targeted funds for I want to retire in 2065 or I want to retire in 2030. Mm. 
And the whole idea is they'll shift your risk tolerance as you go through time because the closer you get, you want less risk, you want more assurance. When you're beginning, you want more risk because you can get the money up. And then 1%, so 1% on $100,000 versus 1% on a million. Mm. So both 1%. Yeah. But if you build it up early, that 1% adds up a lot more. It keeps adding up. Yeah. So you want to risk early and then get more conservative as time goes on so you can get the money out and make sure it's still there. Interesting. And so for you personally, if you are getting older, yeah. you want to take less risk then. Yeah. For me personally, I want to take more risk I'm younger, but I have enough that I make sure I can still pay for my daughter's college. Yeah. And keep that in my low risk fund because I know I need that soon. So yeah, don't risk money you can't afford to lose. Right. But if you're going to invest it, make sure you know when you need it by. Mm, when or do I need it by? if you never need it too as well. If you never need it, have the longest term horizon view possible. What if I die? Who do you leave it to? Are you happy you left it to them? Well, but you can leave it to someone. Oh, yeah. Huh. It's a, it, it can go in your hair and your will. And that's the whole idea for me. Like, I want to build the most wealth I can for my family personally. Right. Interesting. I never really got into it because I never understood it. And I was always yeah. scared of it. I remember back in my 20s when, when I, I think it was a time after I had a couple of fights in the K1 and I had mm-hmm. some, some cash coming in, you know? Yeah. For me, I was I thought I was rich, right? <laughs> so I was spending cash like crazy. I was like, ah, maybe I should do something smart with this money, right? Yeah. So I bought a car with cash. <laughs> <laughs> a depreciating ass. I was going to yeah. fly down instantly. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I was do something smart with this money. And then I bought a motorcycle with cash. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I wanted to try and invest. And okay. I was just like, it just, I just never understood it. Never got into it. They try and make the learning threshold so high. Is what? So that's the whole thing for me. Like, I'm not an expert on this. Can one go out and just like get someone to say, hey, invest my money? Yeah, you can and hire. You can hire. Yeah, there, you can hire a financial advisor. You can hire someone to handle your money for you, or you can also just put it into a fund that will manage your money for you as well too. Right. Either like a hedge fund or a mutual fund. Mm. Both are doing the same idea, and they'll take care of that for you. Just look into who you want, what you want, their past history. That's an easy way to invest. You have to pick companies. Yeah, the way I'd suggest for most people to invest would just be invest in like say the S and P five hundred, which is the five hundred biggest companies in America. Right. Or invest in some Vanguard fund, which is, or Fidelity, or who am I thinking? Are we going to leave some links down below from Dumbfounded Media, probably? Because <laughs> I really want to go check it out, actually. We can do, but I don't think the people you buy it from is as important as looking into them all, because you want to figure out who they're invested in. So they'll have like, tech-based ones, they'll have medical-based ones, and you can invest in those fields, or you can invest in the whole stock market at once. Right. Personally, for me, at the moment, I like Vanguard as my one. They're cheap, but I'm not a financial advisor. I can't tell anyone else to use it. Right. But Personally, they're cheap. They're affordable. They've been the best. They were the first. They were the people who started all this. In the past few years, they have the lowest management fees, so they're great for that. But they have all these different kinds of funds, and you can pick what sector you care about. Right. And that would be much more the way you put money in the bank, though. Yeah. It's not about risking, leveraging. It's, okay, I don't need this money now. I can put this in something that can grow or lose, but I'm okay with it. Whereas if you're talking about individual stocks, then it's much more, okay, let me do the deep analysis on this. Yeah. You treat this much more like the bank. You want something stable, reliable. So that's the whole thing of individual stocks versus ETFs and mutual funds where they group them all together. I feel like I need to go on an online study course and like so really look and into all it that's if I really want there. to understand it. Yeah. So that's what I want to do. I want to be the person for the front line to get people in, get them started, get them looking. And there's so many great resources on YouTube for free. Yeah. There's NYU, like the NYU professor in charge of valuation gives out his master's course for free. Wow. I've watched all of it. It's one of the greatest courses I've ever watched. Yeah. Just that kind of way. There's people like... Um, Sven uh, Sven Carlin, I believe, another great value investor, Patrick Boyle, a hedge fund manager, all these people that are great people offering these tips to people that are experts in this field. To get into them is tough Mm. because you're not going to go out looking for that. You need to get the ease in there. You need to find someone who will grab you and make you want to do it, and then you'll learn the deep details. Right. And that's what we need to do. I think that with YouTube as a platform, now we can bridge that gap that, honestly, for me personally, school never did. Mm. A lot of people, their families never did. And it's all about trying to bridge that gap to get to that information because nowadays it's free. Yeah, it is. YouTube is free. YouTube's free and there's so many people putting great stuff out there. But to go into the deep end, nobody wants to do it first. You have to... Well, YouTube must have killed it last year also. <laughs> Google. <laughs> <laughs> Should have bought stock. <laughs> <laughs> Google's always a good stock, I think, personally. Yeah. But I can't suggest anything to anybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. All right. Does there any last message you want to share with the Tomonachis here today? Thank you for watching. Nick is a great guy. <laughs> He's a great guy to learn from. Great expert. I'm happy with everything I've learned from you for fitness and everything on this top. Man, it's been great talking to you. Cool. Yeah, it's been really fun. Yeah. And I really appreciate you coming on the show. No problem. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Right now, talking finance and cryptocurrencies. 
C, I told you we're gonna learn how to make millions. We're gonna be millionaires, but it's only for you guys. What's the best tip you can give us? 